Hi, my name is Doug Beam, and I've been asked to tell my story. I have been with SAS Power for 16 years, the last 10 of which have been spent here at the Weyburn Training Center working for technical trades training as a specialist in the PLT apprenticeship program. The six prior to that, I was working as a journeyman lineman for Carlisle on the Carlisle crew. And prior to that, outside of SAS Power, I spent quite a few years working for various contractors around Saskatchewan, as well as spent a little time in the States. Back around the fall of uh, 83, I got indentured with uh, a contractor by the name of Industrial Line Contractors, and we were working out of Regina. Uh, about April of 88 is when I became a provincial journeyman. Back in those days, when you became a journeyman, you also got another privilege. You were given a briefcase, you were given a couple guys, and you now all of a sudden became a crew. I was a little nervous about this because I'd never run a crew before, I didn't know the ins and outs, and I approached my boss at that time and I said, I really am not feeling comfortable with uh, running a crew on my own, I don't believe I'm ready. It was convenient because at that time there was a journeyman that had uh, been working down here and he'd been on the road forever and didn't want to be on the road anymore so he approached the same boss and said, Basically, if you don't take me off the road, then I'm probably going to be looking for another job. Journeymen were hard to find back in those days, so the decision was made that he mentors me, shows me the ins and outs of how to be a foreman, and then I was throwing two other guys that were going to be apprentices with me, but these apprentices were as green as green can be. We were working in Fort Capella. It was Thursday, June 2nd. 1988. We're working and looking forward to the end of the week because we worked four tents and uh, this was pretty much our last day. We're looking forward to going home for the weekend. About four o'clock, three, four o'clock in the afternoon, I got a call from Regina District uh, operator that said he had a pole that was taken down by a farmer. And back in those days, we called that green lightning. So it was an emergency situation, so we had to kind of pack up and go and fix this pole before, before anything happened. When we got to the job site, we saw the pole was down. So when the pole falls over, it creates a bit of a deflection in the line, which means it puts it out of straight. We need to tie it back, because if we didn't, there's the chance while we're working there, it would kick out, come back too straight, and while doing that, contact the truck or us or all of the above. The line was still about four or five feet off the ground, but the pole was laying on its side. So we decided to have a little bit of a verbal assessment of the situation, not written, and it was decided that the journeyman and I would tie that pole back using a shotgun, which is a hot stick, and a rope tied to the back of that shotgun, and basically to what we call a temporary ground electrode, which is something we pound into the ground and we hook our grounds to to bring the electricity to ground if there's an accidental energization. So we set this all up, we hooked onto the line, energized, and we tied it back to secure it to this temporary ground electrode, which when we were all said and done, ended up putting the wire about two feet off the ground and we left it energized because back in those days it didn't shut the power off until it was absolutely necessary. So what I instructed was the journeyman to go to the, uh, to the digger truck and he could set the digger truck up and more or less get ready to punch a hole in the ground so that we could put the new pole in. I instructed the green guys to put this piece of hardware on the top of the pole with an insulator that was going to hold the wire back up in the air once we put the pole in the ground. And I told them while they were all doing this that I was going to take a drive and I was going to find a place that maybe we could shut this line off that was a little closer than running all the way back to the highway and shutting off the OCR and also probably a hundred plus customers at the same time. And I come back and uh, to see the same two guys standing there holding this piece of hardware, hardware trying to figure out what side of the pole it should go on. And like I had said earlier, these guys were really green, so maybe I should have left a little bit more instruction, but I figured they'd be able to catch the drift and understand where this needed to go. 
At the same time, the journeyman who was running the digger truck, instead of digging beside the pole, decided to dig right on top of the pole. This frustrated me a little bit because we're in the middle of two fields. Back in those days, you respected a person's position. So if you were a journeyman and, uh, and you were the apprentice, you basically sat in the back seat and you just, the positions is what we used to call it. And uh, in any case, I wasn't gonna tell this journeyman that, you know, it's, we got lots of room here, you can dig beside the pole. So we finally got the hole in the ground and uh, the boys finally got that piece of hardware onto the top of the pole. Now comes time to put this pole on the ground. Now we gotta make it square with the world. And the only way to make it square with the world is look at it in line with all the other poles, make it straight with all the other poles, and then stand off to the side 90 degrees to look at it sideways and make sure it's straight with the world on the side. Once that's all done, then we proceed to fill the pole in and tamp the pole in and make it secure. So it was decided that I was going to line this pole in. So I went and what we call in line with the other poles is called headlining and then I decided to go off to the side and do the side lining as, as well. As I was backing up, I knew that I was getting close to the line. This field being summer follow and harrowed was worked very well and to the point where you would sink into it up to your ankles. And as I was backing up, I wanted to see how close I was to the line. So when I pivoted to see how close I was on the line or how close I was to the line, my right foot dug in and I ended up tripping and falling onto this 14,400 volt line. When that happened, I went down on all fours and I was in contact with this line. So when I contacted the electricity, it entered into my arm here. It went through my arm here, out into my side here, out my feet into the ground. While I was in contact with this line and I was awake and I can almost see it, I can see it, in my eyes, I was facing north and I know what alternating current is and it goes back and forth 60 times a second and I could feel that, I could feel that. I remember having my mouth open, looking straight north and not being able to scream and I could hear in the background, I could hear the journeyman like talking and screaming at these other two guys that were gonna basically come and help me and them not knowing what the potential was, the journeyman telling them not to touch me. And shortly thereafter, I had fallen clear of the line and come to realize what the journeyman was doing was trying to find another shotgun or some other hot stick that he could pull me clear. Luckily, I felt clear. Had he not taken uh, or understood to get these boys and keep these boys away from me, we probably would have had three electrocutions, which would have been really, really disastrous. And the decision was made um, basically to drive me to the hospital as opposed to phoning an ambulance because we were two miles south of Balgoni. And uh, by the time an ambulance would have got there, who knows what uh, the outcome would have been. So. I do remember parts of this as well, is when they put me into our service truck and uh, one of the young, one of the kids, basically they threw me on top of him and he was holding me because obviously I was in a little bit of shock to say the least and I had my feet hanging out the window. As we were driving toward, the, toward Regina, um, I, the pain really started to set, settle in. It was like uh, like they were literally on fire. I had my feet hanging out the window and it was like, it was literally like it, they were on fire. We were headed toward the Plains Hospital and the Plains Hospital was uh, informed that we were on our way. Well, when I got there again, remembering there was a lot of people and they threw me on a gurney and started cutting things off of me, like my boots, my pants. Got me prepped to really do an analysis as to what the damage, what kind of damage there actually was. To explain what 14.4 would feel like as an alternating current,
I compare it to putting your head into possibly one of those paint mixes that you'd find at a paint store or Canadian Tire and multiply that by about a thousand because it's alternating current so it pulses back and forth. So that gives you an idea of what it feels like and I felt that. Here's where things get a little fuzzy. They also gave me some painkiller, Demerol and morphine to be exact and I think they, if memory serves they gave me the absolute most that they could on both. Basically the decision was made that my uh, I was going to lose my left leg below my knee and uh, they weren't quite sure what they were going to do with the right. So one of the tests that they performed on my right leg was they took a needle and they put it into my heel pad and I wasn't to see this. They did it when I, when I was looking the other way and asked you let us know or say let us know when you feel this. So I knew what was going on. So when they were pushing this needle, I, as soon as I felt it, I said, right there. Well, lo and behold, they already had the needle in about this far. So what they said was because of the fact what electricity does, it cauterizes your blood vessels so it restricts the flow. So that said, I wasn't getting the circulation that I needed to more or less uh, retain my right foot. So the decision was made that the right foot was going to be gone. Sometime Saturday afternoon, the doctors came to me and said, here's what's going to happen. We're going to put you under tomorrow, and we're going to remove your left leg just below the knee, and we're going to remove your right foot. So the left leg, that operation is called the below knee amputation, and on the right leg, that's referred to as a symes. So what they do is they cut the heel pad, they pull out your foot and then they put the heel pad back on so I still had the better part of my leg but with no foot. Okay, well, that was going to be the decision. Now, there was a lot of self-talk going on with myself because all of a sudden where I thought if I was going to lose one appendage, I could adapt with the other one. Now all of a sudden they're going to take both. Okay. This changes the game. How does a guy walk? How does he, how does he, what's going to happen here? Am I going to be confined to a wheelchair? So, needless to say, a lot of self-talk. I convinced myself that this is the way it's got to be. I'm not dead yet. Uh, bring it on. Let's do this. So Sunday, uh, when time for the operation, uh, I'll say it was in the morning. Um, they came in anesthesiologist put me under and uh, they do what they got to do and I wake up uh, one of the things that I see and got ha halfway coherent with is when I look down toward my feet I realized that they had actually did it the covers were flat there was no place where my feet were sticking up as they were not 24 hours earlier so this is where you're truly tested. You don't know what you're capable of until you are tested and this was kind of the ultimate test for myself. But I'll tell you this much, you cannot take away uh, the power of family. I was supposed to be married in July, July 30th to be exact, which uh, this is a heck of a way to get out of getting married, but uh, Cindy is one of the toughest ladies I know on the planet. But what needs to be understood here too is I've been blessed. I've got some, I had some really good friends at that time and still do the, to this day. And uh, through the support of all of those people, um, it keeps a guy going forwards instead of going backwards because there was definitely room for, for uh, the chance of going backwards. Here we are, we're on the road to recovery. So I spent basically two weeks at, at the Plains Hospital. They put me as an inpatient at Wiscana Rehab. And uh, once I was in Wiscana Rehab, now we start with, okay, how do we get this guy standing again? Within the first couple, three days that I was there, they had me standing. It was incredible. They, my left leg, they had a cast on it, a 
and they had a cast on my right leg and at the bottom of the cast they put uh, an adapter so they could actually physically attach a leg to that prosthetic leg obviously and a foot onto the right leg and get a guy standing. The reason for this is so a person doesn't slip back and doesn't go into that deep dark hole, hole and lose um, uh, the ability to move forward. So it was good and it, it, it felt good. It was very uncomfortable as far as uh, the, the physical pain that was involved, but it felt good to be standing again and it reassured me that I'm not going to be spending the rest of my life in a wheelchair. So as part of the, uh, the rehabilitation, uh, especially my left leg was gone just below the knee, my right foot was gone, but what they had to do uh, to help me along uh, with the, the sensation because it was, it was painful. I don't know what was more painful, the 14-4 or what I'm about to tell you in regards to how they had to desensitize the limbs. Um, with my right foot being gone and the heel pad being folded over my leg, the way they desensitize the stump so that I'm able to weight bear on it was basically grab it by the ankle and hit it for about 20 minutes every day. Through the course of the next couple of weeks, going through that, going, getting used to the, the prosthetics that they had given me, the uh, pylons is what they're called, um, it was determined that there's a possible chance that I could go home. So after a two week stay in the hospital, a two week stay at Wascana, they put me through a couple of tests as in, can I get dressed by myself? And if you can picture this, no feet, you got to pull up your pants. Can I get onto the toilet by myself? I can't walk up to the toilet, I got to crawl on my knees. Can I get into a bathtub? Can I get into a bed? So they said, before I can go home, I got to prove this to them. So I said, okay, let's do this. Bunch of things were good there. I only spent two weeks in the hospital, two weeks in Wiscana, and I was home as an outpatient. I was home with my family. I was home eating my own food, able to get around in my own house. So it was good for the rehabilitation all the way around. When I was in the hospital, the head of Wiscana came around and he was making decisions as to uh, what we're going to put on me for prostat uh, prosthetics and everything else. And he asked me a question. He says, do you have any idea what you're going to do with the rest of your life? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, what would that be? And I said, well, I said, I'm a lineman by trade. I plan on going back, climbing poles. I said, I love my motorcycle. And I said, I plan on riding my motorcycle. And uh, I said, I like to dance, so I plan on dancing. And he kind of looked at me and he said, don't you think you're setting your sights a little high? And that's what I needed. And I said, no, not at all. Also through the course of uh, the next couple of months, um, I did go to a, a, a machine shop, manufacturer, fabricator, in Regina as well as talk to my prosthetic guy and said with my spurs they come apart and I said can you put this part into the prosthetic solid enough to take my body weight and he said yes. And I went back to the fabricator and I said can we make this part so these two parts kind of lock together that I can go back climbing and he said yes. I said okay good. So after a couple of weeks a little bit of ingenuity, I was able to climb again, and I did. And I thought that was pretty cool. Along with that, I also had a buddy of mine, a good friend of mine, that was a welder. And I had him come over to my house, and I said, can we fix my motorcycle so that I can ride it, retrofit it? He looked at my bike. Yep. Well, four hours later, I was riding my bike. Little shaky but nonetheless riding my bike and talked to my wife and uh, 
basically it was decided that I'm going to get married or we are going to get married again. We picked another date, which was October 1st. And I said, I want that date because there's no way that I'm going to go down the aisle in a wheelchair. I'm going to walk down the aisle and I'm going to dance at my wedding. We did that as well. So I pretty much had accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. After I had gotten married, I got a letter in the mail from SGI saying that I no longer have a driver's license and I had a, a 1A. And I'd already been driving very shortly after my accident with my, with my prosthetics. I proceeded to uh, find out what I needed to do in order to get my driver's license back. I was wanting to go back to work. So I managed to get everything in place and I started back to work around February of, uh, of 89. And I mean back to work. I was driving the trucks, I was uh, running the diggers as an operator, I was building power line, I was tying in. Obviously not with my spurs, but I had done that. So I proved it to myself that I could do that, but obviously not with the same grace that uh, I could climb prior to having my feet, but I could do it. I did this up until I joined the team at the training center in 2007. To say that working out in the field uh, through those years was trouble free would be a lie. I had everything from sores on my stumps that required sometimes going to uh, the dock for some minor surgery as far as uh, lancing a boil to uh, basically the frustration of not being able to get my legs on because they, they swell, because I was on them too long. Sometimes it ended up, I threw them against the wall just in sheer frustration. But there's a couple things that keeps a fella going is one, um, I'm alignment. And this is what I wanted to do. I didn't want to change my career. I wanted to stay as alignment. So you deal with it. Sores heal. So it's just like anything else. You give it a little time and they heal. This is one of the most challenging, diverse, and rewarding trades that I can think of. That's why I stayed, uh, that's why I pushed through what I pushed through. This was a pretty traumatic uh, accident that, uh, that I, I, I don't wish on anybody. But in the same token, people go through challenges and you gotta try and find the, uh, the cherry, if you will, in those challenges. For me, it's, you gotta take a look at my situation with the fact that I don't have any feet. I've never heard Cindy complain about not having enough room in her bed. I don't ever have to worry about cold feet because I don't have any. When it comes to stinky feet, I don't even know what that is. I just put on a pair of socks and I wear them till they fall off and I put on another pair. The other cool part of it is on your driver's license in that little box that says height, mine says variable. When I got married, I was 6'1". Cindy kind of enjoyed that. Whereas to me, that's too tall. So when I finally settled down on what I was, which was 5'9", that's where I am right now, is 5'9". So if you keep things in perspective, um, you make it to just about anything with time. To give you an idea what I've been walking on for the last 30 years, here's what it looks like. Before I end my story, I'd like to talk to some of the events that I do believe in my case uh, led up to my accident. First one I'd like to talk to is the journeyman. I had a veteran that was uh, overseeing, mentoring me in regards to uh, getting me started as a crew foreman. Uh, myself, as a new journeyman, um, I still held the respect for the old veteran, meaning I really wasn't wanting to go against what he said. I was going to respect his wisdom on how to do things even though there was a couple times through the course of that day I was a little frustrated with him. If there's something that needs to be said, 
it should be said. And if the supervisor um, is a good supervisor, they will respect that and respond accordingly. Second thing, I mentioned that the two guys that I had on my crew were green. Now, I put some of this on me. I could have spent a little more time with them, maybe showed them how to put this thing onto the, the pole, this piece of uh, hardware that needed to be on the pole, rather than just assume that they knew what they were doing or could figure it out. The weather. Back in the day, we didn't have any FR clothing, we never had high vis. I had a pretty good tan, and all due to the fact that I could take my shirt off, and that's how we worked. Okay, hard hat, no shirt, obviously line boots, but when your humidex is as high as what it was in those months, it does wear on you, and you do maybe get a little out of sorts, especially when you're in it for 10 to 12 hours a day. Fourth and final, time. I mentioned that this happened on the last day, toward the last hours of that last day. Was my head fully in the game? I'd like to think so, but I can't say for sure. You think about the way things are nowadays. We start Monday morning. We try to get our head into the week to come. And as we progress through the week, we kind of put ourselves into our, our job. But when Friday hits, maybe pick up the pace to get things done faster, just so we can get home to enjoy the, the future weekend. This is what I believe contributed to my accident. What we have today are better work methods, better work practices that ensure that we make it home safe at night to our families. If you related to this, great. But most of all, I hope you can realize some of the indicators that could potentially lead to disaster and avoid it. That said, I think it's time we bring this to a close. I hope you enjoyed my story. I hope you found it interesting, entertaining, and possibly inspiring. Um, before I close this right off, I'd like to thank Lindsay Sterling for all the hard work and effort that she's put into this. She's done an awesome job, and I'll bid you adieu.